Since we're doing a review about the room, Carl, can we get a bottle throw from you? Oh, a Tommy Wiseau-esque bottle throw. I think we can. So that is it. I did not hit her. I did not. Oh, hi, Brad. Now what do I drink? Oh, I've got an idea. <laughs> The room is, depending on who you ask, a work of filmmaking genius or a cinematic turd that was rolled in glitter the moment it was released on DVD. Infamous for its virtually unintelligible plot, the room very almost contained a scene where the main character is revealed to own a flying vampire car. So there are probably going to be people watching this who haven't seen The Room. And I feel sorry for those people. So if you haven't seen The Room and you don't know about, like, you know, known hero of this earth, Tommy Wiseau, who wrote, funded, directed, produced and starred in the movie, The Room is theoretically about a love triangle between a large penis banker called Johnny, played by Tommy Wiseau, and his girlfriend Lisa. Oh, no, so, not a girlfriend. My future wife, <laughs> Lisa, future wife, Lisa, and his best friend, Mark. Johnny's my best friend. I know. He's your best friend. Due to the frankly heroic amounts of ineptitude shown by Tommy Wiseau at virtually every stage of the production process, the film is unintentionally one of the most hilarious movies ever made. Yeah, I mean, it is just such a bad film. Oh yeah, I can't think of any aspect of the film that hasn't been criticised in some way, and that's just, that's just the best. <laughs> so do you know what my favourite example of the thing Tommy was so somehow managed to fuck up? What? The credits. How do you fuck up the credits? It's words. Spell check exists. Do you know how they fuck up the credits? What? Well, they spell some actors' names wrong. <laughs> so, that must have pissed some people off. And like. The one that always gets me is that somewhere in the credits they list an actor who played barista number two. There's no barista number one. <laughs> How'd you fuck that up? If you'd have just fucked up one aspect of it, it's like, oh, that's embarrassing. When you fuck up the credits, man, that's amazing. Also, like, everything, like the sound, because I think every line in the film by like a handful are dubbed. And like, the editing's terrible, the acting is awful. There's like boom mics in shot half the fucking time. They move around like, you know, props in between scenes, so to fill out scenes, creating like massive continuity errors. It's fucking amazing. Isn't that what, to do with the spoons that are everywhere? Yeah, the spoon, people don't know. There's this, like, this running gag in the film. It's like similar to like Rocky Horror Show, I guess, isn't it? Where audience participation is a big part of midnight screenings of the rooms. The room is now massive on the midnight circuit. In the film, for no reason, there are framed pictures of spoons all over Tommy's apartment. I didn't get much sleep last night. And whenever they appear on screen, what people do in the audience now at midnight screens is throw plastic spoons at the screen. <laughs> and I looked this up because I was curious, and according to like, the, um, the set dresser for the film, that's just like what appeared in the picture frame when they bought it from the shop to like, you know, dress the apartment. However, Tommy kept making them move the photos around for when he changed like, you know, the angle of filming because he wanted there to always be something in the background. So they moved the same photo frame with the same spoon in it into the background of multiple shots. So it makes it look like Tommy Wiseau is just obsessed with this single picture of a spoon and bought like 40 pictures of it. We need more to dress the set. Dress photo from there. Okay, Tommy, same photo frame. Now Tommy looks like he's obsessed with fucking plastic spoons. Now he looks like a recovering heroin addict or some shit like that. But because obviously Tommy was so, like, you know, the auteur that he is, they had to listen to him. Because this is true. Like, did you know this? Tommy was so fired the entire cast and crew of that movie anywhere between one and three times. Depending on which interview you read, with Tommy Wiseau, because he's changed his mind on how many times he fired the entire staff. And this is another one that always gets me. Do you know how much the room cost? Like the budget for the film? It's five or six million. Six like million that. dollars. And I think the quote from James Franco is, it costs six million, it looks like it costs six dollars. And a lot of people assume, oh man, this film, it had to be like some sort of front or a money laundering scheme. It's like, no, it really did cost that much money to make because Tommy Wiseau was that fucking inept. For example, do you know one of the biggest costs to the entire film? What? The fact that Tommy Wiseau filmed every single scene twice. How do you film every scene twice? What Tommy Wiseau did is he bought two cameras, one digital HD camera and a 35mm camera. Digital and film? But you'd need twice the crew, uh, twice the equipment. I mean, 
how both they're lit differently. What's the point? Well, Tommy Wiseau has since claimed that he did this so that he'd be the first director in history to film on two formats simultaneously. In reality, according to people who worked on the film, like Greg Sestero, obviously the disaster artist, he says that Tommy bought a book called How to Make a Film, and in this book it says, oh, if, you want, if you're filming a movie, you may want to film it on either film or more modern directors might opt to use digital formats. And Tommy didn't understand that, so he just bought both. <laughs> and then stuck them together. And you can find a picture of his custom mounted rig, and it's real. And then all he, he only edited, though, the film footage. So there's still a shit ton of, like, HD quality footage from a slightly different angle out there somewhere that's never been touched. We need other camera right now, right here next to this one. All right, yeah. Digital camera. Sorry about that. Yeah, get the two okay. cameras. Let's here. go, everybody. Come on. In addition to just general production and editing foibles, the film is infamous for its abrupt and seemingly inexplicable tonal shifts. For example, consider perhaps my favourite scene in the movie, where a woman announces that she has breast cancer, which is then promptly never addressed again. I got the results of the test back. I definitely have breast cancer. Look, don't worry about it. Everything will be fine. Is that scene the most epic sandbagging of cancer ever seen in fiction? I think it might, it might be. just be, might it? And like this film, for people who haven't watched it, and I recommend that you go watch it right now, at least the highlights. Like that is like just par for the course in this movie. Like obviously one of the most famous clips is the one I tried to like, you know, mock at the start of this um, video where it's like, I did not hit her, I did not hit her, I did not. That's Tommy Wiseau, like you know, trying to like, you know, pour his heart out. That's his Oscar nomination scene. And he without warning, inexplicably, turns to his friend and goes, Oh, hi, Mark. I did not hit her. It's not true. It's bullshit. I did not hit her. I did not. Oh, hi, Mark. Isn't that the same scene as well where, like, Greg Sestero, in another Oscar-worthy scene, tells the story of a girl he knew who got brutally beaten up in an alleyway or mugged or something? Something like that, yeah. And Tommy was so looks and goes, ha, 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 what a story. One of them found out about it, beat her up so bad she ended up in a hospital on Guerrero Street. <laughs> What a story, Mark. And the thing is, though, like, you'd expect it coming from Tomics. English is not his first language. But the other actors, what excuse did they have? <laughs> other than that Tommy's direction made them terrible. Just being caught in his badness aura made them unable to act. I know a lot of people like the film, but I don't really like the film as much as I love the idea of Tommy Wiseau as a person. Because he's just like an enigma wrapped in a mystery covered in a pair of sunglasses. And I fucking love the idea of just this human being who people cannot understand. So, do you know how old Tommy Wiseau is? How old are you? Wow, well, that's first question. Question. I ask people that question. That... Don't worry, I'm Greg age. You're 19? Yeah. No, no one knows how old Tommy Wiseau is. You can look it up on Wikipedia, his age is listed as unknown. Because Tommy was so like when he's asked in interviews anything about his like you know his past or his personal life or any biographical information whatsoever, he gives contradictory garden path answers that don't really answer the question. So nobody knows how old he is, no one knows what his real name is, and no one knows where the fuck he's from. Where are you from? It's a simple question. I'm from New Orleans. New Orleans. It's from the bayou. You guys hear that? This guy with this fucking accent is from the bayou. He is a movie director who is world famous at this point and no one knows like the most basic biographical information about him. And I love that. I find that more fascinating than the film itself. It's great. Also as well, no one knows where he got the money from. Do you know that this film cost $6 million? No one knows where Tommy got the money because he funded the entire film out of pocket. So this man, who no one knows anything about, all we know is that he wears dark sunglasses and has a vaguely Eastern European accent, somehow had near unlimited cash reserves to make this vanity project. Uh, there are no theories at all? Well, there are a couple of theories, and what, none or all of them may be true. One of them is that Tommy was hit by a big dick movie producer back in the day, and he received a large out-of-court settlement for, you know, not suing the shit out of him. And they theorise like that's how he got, like, got fell in love with the movie industry. Another one is that he's got ties to organised crime, which you know would explain you know like his um, his vagueness and his backstory and his like act, like his staunch refusal to ever reveal more about his past. And another one, which comes from Tommy himself, is that he used to sell jeans and leather jackets that were imported from Korea, where apparently leather jackets are really cheap. So all or none of them may be true, but like apparently like Tommy had an almost unlimited amount of cash at all times. Like he'd turn like he was always wearing fancy suits, which you can't really tell because his suits don't fit. Um, but he, like, his sunglasses apparently were like five hundred dollars. He drove everywhere in a fucking like Mercedes Benz. Um, he'd like um, and they said when they went out for dinner, he'd always have like three thousand dollars in cash on him at all times. 
just at all times, and they could never figure out where he got the money from because no one ever saw him go to the bank. There's actually money in there? This account? It's like a bottomless pit. Really? Yeah. Tommy. Yeah. That's more interesting than the film itself, and the making of the film is fascinating because the idea that this, like, hilariously awful film somehow got made. Now, ordinarily, a film this bad with this many plot holes, inexplicable tonal shifts and editing problems were relegated to the collective bargain bin of the public consciousness. However, the film is so bad on every conceivable level that it's somehow ascended to the level of being so bad that it's good. As a result, the film is now considered to be an unintentional masterwork of comedic genius. In short, the film failed so hard and so completely that you kind of have to respect it. What does Wasaw think of the fact that everyone considers his film an unintentional comedy when he obviously wanted to go for this light like, love story? Yeah, he set out to make a serious love drama and now everyone thinks it's a comedy. Um, obviously he was hurt at first, I believe at the premiere he stormed out of the cinema and started crying when people started laughing at the film. <laughs> But in more recent years, he backpedalled and claimed that he always intended to make a comedy all along. And he's re-envisioned the film as a black comedy instead of a serious love drama. Something that has been countered by like everyone who worked on the movie said no. He was just so inept, he somehow stumbled ass backwards into cinematic genius. How can they say this about me? I don't believe it. What proof do we actually have that he didn't intend to make a comedy? Mostly it's Greg Sestero and the Disaster Artist book and all the interviews contained therein, which shows that Wasso was dead set on making like a serious love drama and that he just didn't know what the fuck he was doing, as evidenced by the fact so many ridiculous scenes and suggestions had to be cut, including the topic of today's article, a flying vampire car. Yeah, I've been wondering about this since I saw the title of the article. Because I, I actually know a fair bit about the making of the room, and vampires don't come up, like, ever. Yeah, I know. Well, they were going to. Specifically, do you know the scene where the drug dealer confronts Denny? Yeah, yeah. And, like, you know, beats the living piss out of him? You know what? I haven't got five fucking minutes! <laughs> In that scene, Johnny... No, sorry. Tommy, who plays Johnny, was dead set on, at the end of the, um, you know, the scene itself, having a brief shot of his car flying off into the sky. Why? Yeah, you, well, you know what you're saying there? Yeah. The same thing the producer in charge of the scene said, because the producer went over to Johnny. No, sorry, Tommy. Fuck's sake, I get his character in Johnny's mixed up so much. The producer, after hearing the session, went over to Tommy's like, but why though? And Tommy also looked at him dead in the eye and just said, maybe Johnny is vampire. And then walked off. So I don't know much about vampires, like you know, the law behind vampires, but the last time I checked, does Dracula own a flying Mercedes Benz? I don't think he needs is that. To. E is that ever been like part of vampire canon ever? Did vampires also discover Flubber? <laughs> In Tommy Wiseau's mind, this made perfect sense, and like because that was the only supposedly the only hint to the fact Johnny might be a vampire. But like maybe if you like you know Johnny had flown off into the sky, or like gone <laughs> and flown off, maybe yeah. But the fact that he says, I own a flying car, therefore, that like, you know, can be interpreted by the audience that Johnny, the owner of the flying car, is a vampire. And he, he saw fit to not explain that any more than he did. My first reaction to seeing a flying car isn't, oh, there's a vampire driving that. No, it's no, because he wasn't driving it. The car flew of its own accord. He wasn't in the car? No, because Johnny's in the scene. Why does he have a sentient flying car? Exactly! Is the car the vampire? I don't know. And here's the thing, well, obviously, like, we can ask these questions and chances are we won't get an answer because the producer didn't get an answer. You got, I just told you the answer they got and that was, maybe Johnny is vampire from Tommy Wiseau himself. And apparently that was enough to him. So Greg Sestero and that producer, obviously, like, they talked Tommy out of including this scene because holy shit is that stupid as fuck. But apparently Tommy was really upset about that. So what he did is he made another suggestion for that scene. And do you know what that suggestion was? What? Giving the guy playing the drug dealer a real working gun and having him fire it wildly into the air to scare the shit out of the actor playing Denny. Firing a real load of gun, firing a real gun into it. And apparently the crew told, like, you know, we're so... You can't do this. And Wiseau's response was, I can do what I want. I'm the director. I can do what I want. Would you tell Hitchcock he can't have a real gun? And someone just said to him, Tommy, you're not Hitchcock. <laughs> they eventually talked him down and said, no, it'd be illegal to fire a gun this close to, like, you know, a business. And okay, I'll give him a fake gun. 
So what he did is he gave him a, he gave the actor a BB gun, and you can tell it's a BB because apparently there's like airsoft down the side of it. <laughs> of course it fucking does. So apparently what he did instead is he just told the actor playing the drug dealer, okay, you haven't got a real gun, we'll just scare the shit out of the guy playing Denny, which is why he's so aggressive to him in that scene. Where's my money, Denny? Where's my fucking money, Denny? Did you lose my fucking money? Can you imagine though, if this film would have had a scene with a flying count that was never explained? And then, like, years later, people ask him, so, like, you know, that enters the realm of, like, you know, filmmaking myth, along with, like, you know, the spoons and the football playing scene. People are asking him in interviews, and so, what is the purpose of the CGI flying car? And he just taps his nose like that and goes, I won't tell. You know, if you look, the clues are there. And the clue is that he's carrying a fucking immortal vampire man. <laughs> you, you know what, Tommy Wiseau? You continue doing you. Shine on, you crazy fucking diamond. I feel like we didn't have enough time to just talk about The Room. Oh, I love The Room. So let's talk about The Room for a bit then. What's your favourite thing about, like, you know, the making of The Room or, like, all the behind-the-scenes shenanigans that occurred? I think it's got to be The Billboard. The Billboard. Oh, my God. The Billboard's <laughs> amazing. OK, so people don't know, to, like, you know, promote the film, he bought a giant, giant billboard and it stayed up for five fucking years. And everyone in Hollywood was like, people complained about that billboard because they found it scary. And people went to the film expecting it to be a horror movie. And it turns out it was like a film about like, you know, a sexy vampire man. <laughs> and like, he funded it for, for someone worked out, it cost like $400,000 to keep it up for five years. And they asked like, you know, Tommy, how would you afford it? And he's like, oh, 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 you know. I love as well that for the disaster artist, James Franco bought the Box same billboard. With the same pose, doing the same picture. That's fucking brilliant. That's like Deadpool levels of marketing right there, isn't it? What about you? What's your favourite thing? Oh, I don't know. It's the, um, the football tuxedo bit. As in, why is it there? Yeah, it's like, again, people don't know there's a huge plot hole in this movie, like, you know, amongst others. Like, you know, as you're driving down the road that is the room, you're going to fall down at least, like, fall the plot holes. Like, you've got to get your fucking tyres checked after driving down that road. And you get, and this is like, it's one scene where inexplicably, every male character hangs out in an alleyway wearing tuxedos that don't fit playing American football, just throwing the ball around. And there's a great story from behind the scenes where Tommy was watching that back, like watching the dailies back. And um, like Greg says, like, what the fuck is this scene? I don't get it. It adds nothing to the plot. There's no explanation for it. And apparently Tommy's watching it back on the dailies. We're just like, he's crying his eyes out. It's like, this is it. This is, like, this is American male bonding right here. And it's like, so he fucking, I think he wanted to make that scene just so he could play American, like he could just play catch with people. But um, they've asked Tommy like loads of times, and it's what the fuck does this scene mean? And people interpret it to me, oh, they went for like tuxedo fittings before the wedding, obviously that never happens. It's like, no, 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 no. Because Tommy has explained it in one interview I tracked down. And someone asked him straight up, Tommy, what is the purpose of the fucking tuxedo scene? Do you want to know what Tommy Wiseau's answer was? I genuinely do. Yeah. Sometimes playing football without protection is dangerous and exciting. That's not an explanation! Yes, it is. No, it's not. Yes, it is. In Tommy Wiseau's mind, that was an explanation. I would have preferred because they're all vampires to that. You know what? I would prefer if every question he ever got asked about this movie ended with because they're all vampires. <laughs> Why does Tommy have so many pictures of spoons in his apartment? Because he is a vampire. O okay, so what about the football playing scene? Well, they're all vampires. O okay, okay, Tommy. But then what about, you know, um, the woman who has cancer and they sandbag it? Well, she is a vampire. Cancer means nothing to a vampire. Do you not know vampire law? Like, you're fucking right there, Tommy, man. What about, what about, you know, the scene where like, he limply throws the water bottle on the floor? What's that about? He's a vampire. Vampires do not know anger. They, they feign emotion. This is starting to make a lot of sense, Tommy. Okay, so what about, you know, the scene where Tommy laughs at the idea of someone beating up? Well, he's a vampire. He cares not for human problems. That's so, like, we should just try for every fucking plot hole ever. It's like, they should get the director to trot them out and let's go, they're a vampire. <laughs> In that voice. Just in Tommy Wiseau's voice, or the best impression of it. It's so fucking good. I love the idea of explaining it when they are vampires. <laughs> it's like, it's like, you know what? Yeah, I get that. That's pretty fucking cool. 
by explaining Paul Hall's way, they are vampire, and then never expand upon it at all, just let the fucking, like, you know, fanboys work it out. So why in Jurassic World do, like, you know, Bryce Dallas, Harrod, Bryce Dallas Howard's character not get arrested for, like, you know, releasing the dinosaur into the park and putting the lives of humans below profit margins? She is vampire. If anyone in the comments asks why my audio might sound a bit different. Oh yeah, it's because Brad is vampire. Brad is vampire now. Well, maybe Brad is vampire, you know that. It's like, Carl, why are you drinking in this video but you're not acting drunk? It's like, maybe Carl is a vampire. We should do this. We should do this. Just one day. It's like, doing like, I wear the green t-shirts in videos. Why is Carl not showing up on camera? Maybe Carl's a vampire. <laughs>